Great. So uh, good afternoon. I'm Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do uh, every Monday afternoon to try and figure out the future for smarter buildings. Great to have you with us today. Um, just in case you're wondering who we are, we are listed on mondaylive.org on the members uh, tab. Um, and also um, just to uh, I highlight the point that views expressed on this call are personal, not of any company or organization. Just keep that in mind. And um, let's um, do make use of the Zoom chat to interact with each other and uh, the course of this hour. Uh, it makes it a lot better for, for the, the conversation. So looking forward to that as well. Uh, and also, if you want anything that's, that that um, anybody is presenting on this slide deck, it is also available on mondaylive.org right there on the homepage. So uh, this being uh, July, uh, we have been uh, talking about integrating uh, silos in buildings, integrating building silos, and all of the sort of the different perspectives of that. So really looking forward to this uh, continuing this conversation. So our normal agenda, our normal sort of news and trends, chit chat, see what's going on, and then um, uh, dive, diving into silos and specifically diving into the silos themselves as to sort of what we mean and how we should be thinking about them. So really looking forward to that. Uh, but before that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Sinclair. What's going on in automated buildings? Yeah, as usual, lots lots of things coming down. Uh, we've I'm thinking about starting up a uh, a session that uh, at least once a month we kind of just do a summary of uh, BAS bytes because uh, there's a bunch of things that we think are starting to change the industry. Uh, we've already started our planning of AHR Expo Orlando. It's late this year, February. Uh, well, traditionally is in January. Uh, we're starting to put our programming together. Um, some things that came across my desk that. Uh, I found interesting was the uh, some more about the independent data layer uh, from Andy Frank, and uh, we reposted that, and I was intrigued with the amount of uh, global input we got, uh, especially out of Europe. So that was interesting. If you click on that, you can kind of go see some of the dialogue on that uh, on that post. Uh, the other one that uh, surprised me was uh, just in from Siemens. Uh, they basically are pushing a new product, a new era of building operation power of cloud connected. They've invented cloud connected uh, while we were while we were working over here in the corner. I think that's uh, interesting because uh, you know they they basically, I think we would have to call it look starting to look like a proprietary cloud and we're kind of we're trying to push an open uh, cloud native approach. Uh, the other one is uh, we had a, a, a and post on the uh, occupancy-based controls. And I think that's an interesting uh, piece to watch because what I think is happening there is they're actually creating a new silo that is not a traditional silo uh, and is probably mostly a cloud native silo. So that's kind of a, maybe a new breed and it might be worthwhile talking about that. Uh, and then of course we have uh, our summary of uh, last month's, uh, I'm sorry, last week's uh, Monday Live, and that's rolled up a bit in the significance of uh, Linux in the uh, building industry and some more uh, information about that. So that's that's kind of a quick, a quick summary. Um, back to AHR Orlando, we're uh, we're trying to uh, figure out how best to take this message. To Orlando, and I kind of suspect the Monday Live and the C4SB group is is doing the same. Back to you, Anto. Yeah, as you said, lot lots of things going on as uh, we start to get to the uh, the summer break um, uh, next month. Um, as we start to think about um, the spring and uh, the the winter meeting in Orlando. Interesting, interesting also about the, the Siemens news. Um, I think they, they, they're calling their product Twitter, right? <laughs> that was supposed X, to be a joke. Because it's called Building X. Is that why you're playing them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I think so. I, I thought I thought I thought that Building X was an unusual uh, uh, title for it. Oh, I see. Sorry, I just got an X Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> You're always a little slow. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was an interesting choice of names uh, in on the back. No, I, I'm not yeah. sure that even thought about that. Also saw a um, post from Johnson Control CTO saying that they're now focusing on autonomous buildings for energy savings. So I thought that was interesting. Wow. Okay. Always out in front of the curve, huh? Yeah. 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 Hey, that that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I think so. I think uh, I think we should all take uh, pride in the fact that I think we we may have caused uh, caused some of this. Uh, I mean, I think they were working on it, but. Uh, that everybody is pushing everybody, I think, is what's happening. And I, I pointed that out in in a email I shared with some folks is just for this is all starting to roll down the hill. And if we don't shape the hill, we're gonna get rolled over and a whole bunch of people are gonna get rolled over. Uh, you know, that's so a really good point, Ken. I, I actually agree with what you're saying there, Ken, hundred percent about I, I think a lot of what there's a lot of impact. And I know it's not direct in you know what we do here or, or the audience that we've got, but a lot of the words and a lot of the materials that we've done, I'm starting to hear to your point, I'm starting to hear feedback from the industry as well. It's it's coming in full circle. You know, sometimes that takes longer, just because that's how the nature of innovation works, right? Um but I'm same as same as you. I'm starting to hear words that have being echoed back that we were talking about in the last six, 12 plus months. I, I think the other thing with us with a lot of history in the industry, it, it sure looks and feels a lot like the whole DDC revolution when we were do, making a radical change from conventional control to like we what we considered virtual controls back in those days. And this whole cloud native thing is very much the same thing. It uh, I, it cries for standards and and adoption that we all kind of move in the same direction. Although uh, it's so new and so glitzy that everybody wants to take it and make it their own piece. So I think uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, try people just trying to figure out how how they're going to come into a uh, a cloud native. Uh, environment so yeah interesting times for sure but it, it does feel very much uh, the same thing as you know the proprietary versus open uh, and I, I, I'm feeling comfortable with our uh, our connection to CNCF cool great yeah there, there's a lot of I think what what we're saying is that there's a lot of commonalities in what what we're seeing and uh, that's really sort of exciting to see that because the commonalities is the is the thing that we've been focused on is to open up open up interoperability and everything else. So that's that's great. But we need we need to get our message out to the building owners and the, the folks that own these university complexes and to the consulting engineers to to basically at least ask for open at that level. I think that's a new concept. And I, it's I'm not sure how your 2525 deals with that, but it it's you've been making some inroads as to what we should be requesting in the buildings and i think we have to put more effort back into that for, because it's that kind of a change if the owners you know if they say wow cloud native you're using cloud native that's what they told me i needed but we have to tell them there's cloud native and cloud native open okay let's move on um i um uh, noted this thing last week that came to the news is that there, there's a building in Canary Wharf, which is this building you see here. Um, I've actually been to it when it was being built back in the, I guess, the 90s yeah. or 80s or whenever it was. And I think my software was somehow being used in that at the beginning, obviously not now. Um, but it's now, the, the lease is now uh, due to, to expire in a couple of years and they're wondering what to do with it. They're going to do this to it. Wow. They're basically going to change it from a, um, you know, sort of a, a typical glass monolith into something that I actually think could look very interesting. And 
this is obviously part of the sort of the office Armageddon sort of flow and just the way I'm looking at it. So I'm kind of um, excited by um, if, if this is what uh, how people are starting to think about redoing their their tall structures. I don't know what uh, what does think. And th this is kind of uh, really interesting because I'm in the middle of reading a book called Subtract which is all about how you can innovate and actually move forward, not just by adding stuff, but by removing stuff, which has clearly happened here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what I want to leave for you guys. Interesting. Yeah. I think they should start building those in a line, like a straight line. In the desert, even. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the desert. Yeah. And connect them all together. So yeah. it's just one building, right? Yeah. Have a train run down the middle of it. That'd be great. <laughs> You're muted, David. You're muted still. We can't hear you anyway. So is this yeah. um an, an an audio issue? Is it is it this is a repurposing of the existing building? This is not a destroy right. and rebuild, right? Right. You, you You're can, taking you can see. Jenga to a whole new level. <laughs> <laughs> Careful of that last block. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. I, I came off mute just to for that bad joke. I apologize. Thank you. Go back on mute. Then. Go back on yeah, mute. Okay, I'll hide my camera <laughs> again too. All right. So anyway, um, I thought that was interesting. Um, the link borders as normal. Um, Anyone else have anything to bring up before we move on? Hearing nothing, let us dive into um, integrating building silos. Uh, so we've been, so this is the fourth week of July. And just to remind everybody what the, the journey that we've been through, we started talking about silos um, and how, you know, why they, they're important. Um, that was kind of the first week, and we thought they're important, and we needed a way of thinking about them because um, they're not just going to go away. Um, and then we spent the second week talking about it from the apps perspective, thinking that apps may well help us in understanding which silos are more important than others. And we did this exercise of of trying to create a mat matrix of um, which silos are important uh, for which which apps, um, and then we ended up basically getting to the point where saying that all silos have some potential value for um, many, if not all apps, right? So it's not a degree, it's just it's either useful or it's not useful. So that didn't really help, although it helped a lot um, in, in many ways. And then last week we talked about Linux a lot because many of the, the systems and many of the uh, things that happen in, in uh, silos uh, are now operating using the Linux uh, operating system and infrastructure around it, which is again, very interesting because we are doing the same thing in the, in the building space. So um, that's all very interesting, but what about these silos? Let's, in, let's look into silos. <laughs> and while this is kind of a cool picture, this is actually not the silo that we mean. When we're talking about silos, we're really talking about the metaphor of silos. And really what we mean when we talk about silos is silo as representing some domain of expertise, of discipline, of industry. That's really what a silo um, to, to in this conversation. So HVAC is a silo because it is that. It is a domain. It, it involves certain discipline. It is, it is an industry. And uh, other things, um, the silo would mean that things that happen inside of it um, have a common uh, objective, right? Providing illumination would be that in the lighting uh, silo. Um, they typically see the same specification if you want to look at it that, from that perspective. So things like the divisions are basically a way of thinking about silos. Um, they uh, people in the silos are typically educated in a similar manner with uh, similar skills, right? And they all have to abide on um, a common set of rules, right? UL 864 is the fire thing. So anybody that's in the fire silo would know that. They all gather in the same um, trade shows. They all belong to the same associations. 
and I can sort of go on and on for, uh, forever here. They typically employ similar uh, branding and marketing strategies because essentially they have common clients. And uh, companies in a silo typically compete with each other with what are effectively similar products or services, right? And the economics are generally somewhat similar. Right? And multiple silos um, is the thing that makes up the as uh, aspect of uh, major assets like buildings. So buildings are actually made up of, of assets. So this is really what we mean by silo. Is this uh, this metaphor of um, uh, different domains, different uh, disciplines uh, needing to work with each other? So the, the the theme of this month is integrating building silos. So the question that um, I'm proposing that we sort of dig into today is really the difference between inter silo and intra silo um, integration or uh, communication. So if you think of this as being inter silo it's actually going it's it, it systems that sit in different silos needing to talk to other silos right so that's an inter silo and this is intra silo so think of um, everything in hvac systems talking with each other right and the 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 sort of the thesis of this kind of conversation that i'm eager to have is what is, what are the difference between these two types of integration if you think about in, inter and intra silo integrations so i made a little um little table little matrix just to uh, kick us off of some really sort of obvious things from a perspective of something like communication protocols when you're talking inter silo the only thing the, the standard are it centric uh, standards or protocols and stuff uh, whereas within a silo, it's obviously going to be more relevant. Um, uh, the the protocols of that silo are the ones that are more relevant, right? So think of BACnet and and uh, things like that in in HVAC, right? Why do you uh, why do you integrate? Um, to, when you're integrating across silos, you're really doing it for some business um, objective, business outcome, to use Mark's words. Uh, Whereas if you're integrating within a silo, you're typically making something in that silo do better things, whatever that is, right? So that's the difference. Uh, the business purpose um, of doing this uh, inter silo is to benefit the asset itself, meaning benefit all the silos. Whereas the, the benefit of um, uh, integration within a silo is to benefit whatever's happening in the silo. You can compare it from a complexity perspective, in which case the complexity of the inter silo is whatever the, the complexity of the asset owner, building owner in our, in our case, and inter, inter silo is different. Um, concerns are different, uh, concern of an asset versus the, the needs of the silo. Collaborators are different. So this is really sort of important when you think about inter silo um, collaboration, you're gonna be um, thinking about collaborating with people in other silos that are not like you. So some of the terms may sound foreign because they are. Um, whereas if you're integrating within silos, it tends to be comfortable you're sort of win with uh, people uh, like you. Um, and the perspective that's required, which is uh, also really important, is that when you're going across silos, you really want a sort of asset wide, shallow um, um, perspective, whereas uh, within a silo, um, you've really got to know your silo well, uh, which, uh, which is the difference. And there's a difference in control in terms of how being hard to manage this partly because you don't know all of the other things, whereas typically within interest silo is much easier because everybody there is sort of talking your language. So I put that up as a, as a starting point. Um, uh, some of you may agree at, uh, agree or disagree with uh, these perspectives, but uh, I'm putting it up as a just to get us going. So, questions you must have, or comments, or critiques. Well, just right off the bat, I <clears throat> I'd say this is a really good list, but as we found out in our previous exercise a week ago, you never can imagine everybody's perspective on things. So when thinking about this, keep an open mind about the reasons for and so forth, so. And it does, it, does that 
flow that that comes from the fact that you know your silo and you really are not that concerned with things outside of your silo. Does that does that follow, or do you think that's a reach? Yeah, I I think a, a major distinction is you know in a silo you're you're in a business whatever that is you're in a vertical you're in the exact same business and outside of that you're not so when you overlay business needs rules on top of this um it it will be different quite often you're competing which you mentioned um when you're in a silo together and interacting and integrating and when you're working outside of your silo it's maybe a little less the case right so motivations about how you behave in those two situations are completely different right how open and interoperable do you want to be with your competitor who could benefit from that kind of a thing for instance so those will be the questions of of the day that will drive how quickly things move in this direction within a silo sometimes i think at least in my experience it's always been the case that everyone is more worried about controlling things in the name of competition than they are opening it up and growing the pie I think that's that's the sort of the intent of that last line the control line is basically what you're what you're referring to yeah cool. other thoughts well I, I agree because i mean that's that's something that we that especially engineers right or even software engineers to be in particular but in technology in general we always put place ourselves in, in in kind of an almost arrogant position and that we know how you should name stuff, group it, categorize it. And I'm, I'm, I believe that we should just build tools and let the smart people that are using our tools um, set that up however they feel is necessary. So yeah, I, I agree, Tracy. I mean, it's like, let's keep it generic. Uh, yep, geocentric, geo yep, object-oriented, whatever you want to call it. Somebody's always going to find a way to use your standard differently than you intended. That's an other whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, even out of spite, right? You know, yeah. they really need to change it. Probably not, but it's just, you know, uh, that, that doesn't work for me. So I'm going to change it no matter what you put in. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, and, and Jim will, will know exactly what I'm talking about. When you look back at, the, the evolution of Lawnworks and BACnet, for instance, both of those were intended to be open, interoperable in the most pure way, right, in, in theory. Yet in the lawn world, even when it came to creating profiles, um, which were sort of the foundational bricks of interoperability, we ended up having to accommodate everybody's different way of doing things, right? So not every thermostat manufacturer had the same feature set, had the same variables and so forth. So we ended up compromising on the least common denominator of things yeah. and making the others optional yeah. attributes, right? In, in BACnet, I, I wasn't nearly as close. That's why I think Jim probably can comment better on this, but it seemed from the outside that there were a lot of sort of flavors of BACnet that evolved out of a very well-written, well-intended specification. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, in some cases, people turn, and, and that happened in lawn too, turn things proprietary, right? Instead of leaving them open, interoperable. But so the, best laid intentions. The, but, but the, the basic, premise of those two protocols uh, that you're comparing are similar because they exist in the same silo right they're not they're not exactly the same obviously uh, but they 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 were created to create sim uh, to to solve similar uh, challenges 
yes, yes and no. In in the case of lawn, it became a standard for semiconductor equipment and trains and a few other things traffic before system. ever was a standard for buildings. Yeah, and traffic control systems. Yeah. yeah. So there was a bigger vision, I think, originally. Yeah. So in the, the uh, what we get out of that is um, multiple silos can actually do sometimes have the same technology and the same protocols and things. Yeah. That they use, which which makes sense. Now, if now, similar. if you take that same thinking, everything we're talking about, and and say Ethernet instead of LAN or BACnet, right? That that didn't come out of. Well, that's probably not true. Somebody would correct me on this, but that didn't come out of and for the pur the purpose of a specific industry. It was communication protocol, computer to computer, and it didn't matter what industry. And so same kind of a thing and, and right. actually much better results in terms of open interoperable connectivity. Of course. I mean, that's yeah. what creates de facto standards because people use it the way they need to use it. Like imagine if we had a consortium on hashtags on X or Twitter, like you must use these hashtags. No, the, the, the hashtags that suck get punished and they don't get used. And the ones that are good don't get punished and they're adopted. And so ethernet was all about, you don't dictate what the content of the payload is. It's just the, it's just the transit of, of the information. Stop trying to dictate the content. That, that was the point of it. And I think the point that you're making. Yeah. And that we need to stop it. That's what that's, you know, basically. Well. Yeah. And it's the hashtag is, is a good example, right? It was, it was a method for tagging. No one said why to use it, how to use it, when to use it, any of that. It was all innovation from that point forward. Yeah. And the most important thing was just this common way to use it, not, yeah. not any of the details. Yeah. I run into this all the time. Like I, I'm, I'm building a, a setup tool for an AI system, right? right? AI application, and we're we're importing Johnson control points, and I'm going through it with the user, and they just get stuck on stuff that's not important or not not relevant. I mean, I was for condenser water temperature. I put C, I camel cased it, lowercase C, uppercase W, lowercase T, CWT. Is that is that haystack stack or brick compliant? Absolutely not. Like that's not the purpose. I'm just trying to get the freaking AI application set up. You know, I just need a little, a little tag. You know, <laughs> which one is the condenser water temp? You know, CWT. You know, which is the set point? CWTSP. I mean, it, but it doesn't work for everybody. But it's it's my tag, and I can use it in context because I'm a power user, right? And I don't care if you want to type out, you know, condenser water or condenser chiller discharge condenser temperature according to Haystack, that, that's fine. Be my guest and, and type, you know, 10 times more characters in it. But why Why do we care about this? And it, it, it's frustrating. You know? You're raising, this is all raising a very interesting question regarding inter and intra silo. When we're in the same silo, a lot of the language, the terms are the same and familiar, you know, across the silo. But as soon as you jump outside of the silo, everything's different and new. So the question is, to me, when I listen to you talk, how important and how far do we take the standardization in order to create open interoperable? Do we need to spell out, you know, using hashtags again, here is the exact spelling with the case sensitivity and everything else? Or do we just say, use a hashtag. So right. this came out actually in um, one of the IBB meetings. We were trying to figure out naming conventions for uh, connection profiles. And um, one of the one of the connection connection profiles that we need we needed to create was one about uh, one that will convey temperature values. Right, and so the obvious one was uh, we use zone temp because we also use the, the zone concept within that. And uh, Matt um, quite correctly says that's ambiguous because temp could be interpreted as temporary 
or maybe some other things, especially when you bring other language into it. So spell it out. Yeah. And so you'll yeah. actually see that in, in the sort of the, the philosophy that we've uh, taken with the naming of uh, IBB is that we spell it out. We, we, we don't abbreviate unless it's a global abbreviation that uh, the whole universe yeah. knows. I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. We, we, we had that same thing in law. And I remember it being part of our standard educational materials where we would use the example of boot. If I say boot, what does that mean? Kind of depends on where you come from, right? Yeah. Something you wear on your foot, might be a kick in the ass, might be the trunk of your car, right? So not everything is universal in language. No. You have to have clarity on that stuff. Yeah. Especially, um, this is especially so when we're thinking about silos and outside of silos, because within a silo, it's reasonable for certain terms to be known and understood. Which 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 goes out the window immediately. You go outside of that silo. Yeah, the other the other way to think about it from the same for that same point. You know, in the silo, yeah, we're all subject matter experts, and we can rattle off all the acronyms um, all day long. Um, and you guys, I know all of you have been in a similar place when you then try to extrapolate what's the value or what you're trying to tell to somebody who's not a subject matter expert. And even when I say, you know, condition water, condenser water temperature, the likelihood of them knowing what a condenser is is probably remote. <laughs> but at least I'm a little bit closer, right? I mean, they can at least Google the word, um, if nothing else. Um, so when you go to the intro, yes, I, you 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 need to provide more rather than less um, to to help right. bridge the gap. Otherwise, you just you just keep having to spend your time trying to educate, right? Um, at the end of the day. And and and, and Anna, it's, it's kind of actually hilarious, hilarious when you start talking about the the misuse of the so-called experts. Like, I don't know if any. And it's funny you mentioned condenser water because that was actually a, a, an error when when uh the very I'm talking version 0.5 of haystack, like it came up with a with like his pet milk or something it was condensed water temperature. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That was an actual thing. And I, I was meeting with Jason Briggs like early on, like over a decade ago. And I'm, it's like, it's just so they got the, they got some software engineers in there. And, and yeah, it was condensed water temperature. I'm like, uh, water's incompressible. Like you're not condensing it. But yeah, it's it's hilarious, you know, and you just come off looking like you, you absolutely don't know what you're talking about. So yeah, probably should use it in context and let people define their own tags. Correct. Yeah, and and that's why you know you, you you need to extend all that information in intra inter silo, you know, or sorry, yeah, inter silo, yeah, you can do kind of what you want to because everybody talks the same language, right? It's it's when you go outside of that and you try to make it across, um, and again, you know, the what you're saving at the end of the day is the education process because we've all been there. You end up spending more time trying to educate somebody on on the, you know, condensed versus condenser because then the, I'm sure the follow up question is, well, what's the difference? So then you have to sit down and then you know how far down the how far down the yeah. at the rabbit hole do you go? Is right, it entering or leaving supply? Yeah. Term, I don't know. <laughs> right, so you're talking about right. name it. <laughs> You're talking about explaining the terms in the inter silo situation. Yeah, exactly right. Is that the, and but I think that's the point everyone's making, right? When you when you bridge that, start to bridge that gap, then the the industry language or the acronyms or the words that you use can't continue. You've got to translate them or expand them or provide context for them, or you you got to make it something that someone else can understand who doesn't come from the domain right um, yeah i think that's the that's the key there is that you cannot use domain terminology let's put it that yeah. way if you're if you're trying to go across domain because it is not likely to be understood well you, you're going to get condensed milk instead of condensed water temperature right <laughs> <laughs> And then that'll go all the way up the system, and then someone's like, "Why am I looking at a graph of condensed milk here?" <laughs> True story, unfortunately. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure we have everyone's got similar ones, right? Where you, you, you know, you, you. I, I, I'll give you one again without exposing who's the whys or what's. But I was going on to, with someone about. I was in a building and I was going on about RTUs and RTUs and RTUs. And the guy finally had to stop me. He goes, I oh, know you, you kept talking about an RTU. What is an RTU? And I literally, you know, took him out of his office to point at him across the building and see those boxes on top of the roof there. And that goes, that's great. That didn't help me. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a remote terminal unit. <laughs> well, that's the other problem, right? And yeah, you, you you'll get misconceptions, which yeah, is oh, of which is worse than condensed milk. Now you're into them thinking something else altogether, which might have relevance but not really what you're talking about um yeah yeah there was this so, whole year-long debate um on the haystack team about just dealing with rooftop hvac units like it's a whole it seemed like a year you know it's like wow the point so again we're sort of trying to compare these two right? wondering if any other thoughts um rick david Steve, Mark, uh, not chimed in. I think I'd say just uh, Alan brought up security, right? I think there's there's a, I think there isn't a, a line here that needs to deal with security of information, which is both both um, you know the content and any PII or GDPR or any of that type of stuff. So there's you know what. You, you need and then there's security of the information itself and that stuff so that's a big deal so into silo you can have a lower level of security barriers um intro you you need to raise the raise the level raise the bar but also there's the other side of that is that into silo between silos you have the benefit of it being the de facto way things are done between between industries right which there's a lot of sort of security related to that but probably the the PII side of things is less right behind there right so it's it's different there's some there's a difference although some people would argue after friday's uh, <laughs> events that, that IT might not be as great as it, everyone says it is <laughs> you always get humble <laughs> that's right <laughs> smart asses <laughs> love to hear from others on this well the the first one of the first top left boxes where it standards are common when you're going in between silos or tribes or domains and um you know it is a is a basic function of communication between dissimilar systems or dissimilar tribes and um, it's it's funny that when we have to do that, we we go to basic uh, symbols, mathematics. You guys are talking about condensing things. Mathematics is a form of condensing communications into basic. Um, well, then IT is just condensing it down to ones and zeros. And so the so the idea of using technology or using math or using IT to figure out how to have uh, communication between dissimilar systems is is ancient and um and the good news is we now have advanced math and advanced technology that's coming right at the right time for um you know bringing solutions of how to condense the communications uh so that both sides can you know put their own context around it and i mean and that's really what we're doing with with c for sb with the ibb with cloud native uh -huh. computing is we're we're trying to come up with those dots and dashes or smoke signals for you know tribes to be able to communicate within uh, between each other nothing new just using a yeah. lot faster uh communications capability yeah, isn't that called a device driver yes and i'll send you that download or i'll, ma I'll email i'll mail you a thumb drive with a device driver for that yes <laughs> yes an interpretation of uh, smoke signals, the original cloud computing or communications. Sorry to get philosophical, but 
I mean that that is what um, that is what um, what's been done for centuries is like let's figure out the common denominators of what can be interpreted by the different different sides of of incompatible uh, incompatible tribes. Yeah, I mean the print tribe is a perfect analogy, right? I mean, that's when Bill Gates had his multi-billion dollar idea back in 1995. He's like, all printers are the same. And immediately everybody said, no, no, there's so much diversity. You'll never be able to do a common print drive. He's like, no, no, no. Printers do seven things. They print, they run out of paper, they run out of ink, they jam up. I'm kind of running out of use cases. For print. And he <laughs> and he just insisted on it. And, and behold, the multi-billion dollar OS API print driver concept was born. Uh, David, David from, from your perspective, you, you're looking at this from the owners, from the financial perspective. Does this, does this jive with your views? Um, does it do anything? I, I actually, so I've been trying to listen and analyze this as everyone was speaking and i'm in i think agreement with everything on the table except for the word silo and i really think we should consider ceasing the use of the word and use system instead because when we look at this thing and use the word system instead of silo it actually, you know, is in very much harmony with our systems of systems thinking historically. Also, it makes more sense from a semantical standpoint. You technically, um, you, I was just making some notes here, um, but you can't, uh, you can't connect two silos together if we're talking about an actual silo and if you think of it as the physical thing um it's it actually is a misrepresentation and silo now has a very negative connotation too and i think if we start thinking of this as hey we're all in this together and everybody has their systems great what runs a system an application typically or that's how you interface it with it. And we want all of these applications and systems to be interoperable and connected wherever it adds value. So my contribution here is yes, let's do a fine change in Word or PowerPoint from silo to system. Actually, I, that's a really good perspective, David, because I, I agree, in fact, one of our analysis is silos implies, you know, like you've got anti, you know, a definitive edge between them. And our analysis of a lot of the folks that we deal with, they don't look at the world. They, they, I look at we look at it more like a bell curve, right? In that they have a central expertise capabilities that's quite really focused. But a lot of them will do kind of flow over into some of the other systems, right? Maybe not as strong as you'd want them to be or, you know, or they're okay. So we look at them more as bell curves. Some some are more pointy and some are more flat, you know, um, bell curves. And, and to David's point, silo just does have a, I'm, stick, I'm, I'm pigeonholing you where that might not really be an accurate representation. Yeah, I think we've, and we've discussed this before. It's, it's the word silo is, a little bit unfortunate that it has this sort of negative uh, view on it and fortunately for us we're going to use it for another week at least <laughs> then we can drop it because the theme of the month is uh, silos so yeah um th th that's that's why we were sort of uh, earlier we were sort of david maybe you weren't on when we were talking about this silo is really just in in our view as a metaphor of a domain or a discipline or industry or or Tribe is the other one that and I was using. So, and and I, I I actually don't agree that it's it should be replaced by systems because systems is uh, is a specific system. 
Whereas what we're describing here, I think replacing it with domain I, is probably the best. I, I disagree. Yeah, I, I disagree. No. I think system's a perfect word. It's all it's compatible with existing paradigms. Like we move from being a master silo integrator to a master systems. I think it's perfectly compatible. And then also when you look at an IT network, that's an IP system and all these other systems are riding on top of it. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know, if we're talking about industries, we should talk about industries instead of silos. We shouldn't use the word silo for an industry. Uh, discipline, uh, engineers, I don't, you know, I'm not sure if the term silo as a metaphor really applies well to the industries and disciplines, but I understand the intent here too. It's like, let's group things together and show how these are grouped together, these are grouped together, and usually they don't interact. I get it. Um, but I think when we talk about systems architecture and having systems in a building inter be interoperable, we should really focus on using the word systems there. And I'm not exactly sure where the words, I mean, I think we should sunset silo through these efforts. I mean, our goal yeah. should be to get rid of the word silo. I I, I want to just add something in to think about when when we say when I think of silo compared to system, um, silo has a broader context in terms of not just being components or parts or hardware or software specific to something. Like that's what when I think of system, that's what I think of. Silo implies a vertical market, uh, common customer set. Uh, you know, all of these things common, listed here. Yeah, and so I'm not sure system replaces silo. I I understand the idea and wanting to get away from the negative of silo, but. Maybe it's something like a vertical or something like that that we need. It, it's more than just if if we say system to a non techie kind of a person, there it's, it's not going to have the same meaning as it does to us. I um, understand where you're coming from, but I think we should say security industry instead of the security silo. You know, if we're talking about, um, you know, the HVAC mechanical contractors and controls, let's call it that. Really silo, I mean, I don't wanna kill a dead horse already here, but um, silo, silo is like a bad pronoun that we shouldn't use anymore. I like, that, I like the concept of the word industry because industry implies, of course, industrious, right? It implies yep. getting something done. It implies an output. It, it implies an outcome. Let me put it that way, right? Industry implies you're producing some outcome. Um, so if we were to vote. In, would... So my pronouns are system, <laughs> vertical, industry. Domain. Don't call me a silo. Thank you, Tracy. Domain is another good one. David Katz. Yeah. 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 So Enough. how does this, and the, the purpose of the, yeah, so we can beat up one silo and job. It, it's been useful for us to have this conversation and we can forget it after this month. Uh, but really the question is the difference between going between, between, be, going between silos and going between, uh, with, uh, okay, this, this is where systems fall apart, right? Because you cannot use the word systems here. Right, because this is, these are all the boxes. The boxes are all systems, right? So these are intra, um, intra silo, but these are systems connecting in the same silo. Whether the where these are systems going between silos. Yeah, you can I still. Think, I think that's a quite program. So I, I definitely disagree with that because my wife has a system of organizing my socks. So, I mean, it's a system is also a way of organizing information, data, or things. So, I right, but the, 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 point, the point is that if you consider this line, just take one of the lines, right? This yeah. line 
exists between two entities within the same, I won't use the word silo, within the same domain or industry, right? Well, give, no, this, look, this Anto, region. sorry, give a concrete example. Like when I see this, I'm thinking an air handling unit is on a back okay. net so, loop so with this, a processor. Yeah. What? Right, so this is a carrier killer uh, uh, and um, Belimo VAVs, let's say, whatever. Okay. Right. Right. So these are all, and so to use BACnet here would make a lot of sense because BACnet yep. is what is used in this silo industry yep. domain. Right. Right. And still, these are different systems, whereas this line is between, let's say, the Belimo system. Um, and the C CMMS system, and this one's, um, I don't know, uh, ERP or whatever. But your, right, your, so... your inter and intra differentiates there. I mean, intra works for me, intra systems within the, within the subsystems and inter systems uh, above that. I mean, it does talk back to our whole systems of systems concept. I can't remember it was up. But, uh, right, but, it, uh, but then you say that this is a system to system con connection and this is a system to system connection. That's, While that's that right. statement is correct, it does not identify the difference between them. Yeah, because you've got the word inter and intra. I've got an intra system connection or I've got an inter system connection. Yeah, exactly. Right. I think it we should call it things. No, we, we're getting to. Yeah. Linguistic, which is yeah. Remember in the English language, there's always multiple words for the same thing, right? Yeah. So speaking of which, I haven't I, I apologize for coming late to this to the party here. Um I want us to, you know, listening to Keith earlier, your uh discussion you had around uh condenser water and having some simple way to represent it other than a you know. A long drawn out term, but the whether it's brick or haystack or any other standard for uh, representing data, it occurs to me that um, first is a question like with haystack: is there within the haystack standard is there any overarching glossary that defines the terms that they use? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's the whole point. That's what it. it is. Yeah, you will use these terms. Okay. No, but I'm saying with like condenser water, whatever the whatever the tag is that they come up with, yeah. do they do they have text that adjoins to the tag to, to the un uh, to the person who's not sure what the hell they what the tag is that uh, they can look. You at. mean the you mean the meaning? The meaning. Do they have somewhere where you can look up what that what is meant by that yeah. tag? They do. Okay. It's, it's actually pretty well defined, Steve. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I'll, I'll so, it. so where I'm going with this is I'm thinking in terms of how, uh, because we haven't had this discussion up to now, using use of AI to parse whatever is out there and to draw inferences about, so if I'm looking for something that's relative to space temperature or uh you know, uh, chill water temperature. And, and all I want to do is type in some text that is there anything out there amongst all these systems that is relevant to that? And it and it and it comes back and says, yeah, I found this, 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 and this in these different systems. Yeah. As a tool, to me, that would be very valuable. You just described how we set up our AI applications. We discover the points. And this, and we have a heuristic system that goes in an AI machine learning system that mm -hmm. knows the different flavors, and it comes up with predefined tags for all the points in it as best it can, and that's it gives good. you a hint. Well, that's that's great, Keith, and that because I I think that's I you're again I'm not I haven't had the opportunity to really look at what your product does today. I'm just saying generically, if we're going across silos and we're dealing with all these different individuals who have who don't know necessarily uh, the specifics of any one silo or domain, right? But they may, they they probably haven't because of what they're trying to do. They are looking generically for something that's like that, right? And so they really going to want to express it as best they can. And they would love this AI application to go out there and say, "Find me something that sort of looks like this." Yeah. Um, so, so an, another another row on this table that I should have added is the semantics, 
what you're saying is that the semantics in an in intra silo, in other words, when everything's within a, an industry or a silo, mm -hmm. it's it's going to be understood, right? Right. Exactly. If somebody in HVAC was listening to Keith just now, whether he said condenser or condenser water, whatever it is, they would have figured out. Oh, he's trying to say something. He may not have got it right. Whatever. They, right. the the under the understanding would have come across. Right. But if if he's if he's, if the listener was somebody that was in the uh, some other silo, right, they would have absolutely no clue of the of, of those what yeah, the meaning of those. Right. And they probably right. shouldn't have. They should probably shouldn't have a clue because they shouldn't be the ones that right. find the application. I mean, I, right. So I, I yeah. So I guess the, the 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 question that that leads to is that how do you then integrate in the inter silo situation when the meaning is not understood Good. within the silos? That's that's what I'm asking, and that's a right. good conversation for another day. But because I know yeah. we're, out of, we're out, of, out of time, but I want well, to at least to good, get it out there. That's a good lead for next week's, which will be the yeah. the last week in, in this month. Okay. In preparation yeah, good... for that, could I could I have maybe five minutes next week to kind of to demonstrate like a concept of what that looks like? It's it's, it's very fast. Okay. Yeah, love to. Right, you got it. it. You can take 10 minutes as far as I'm concerned, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's very simple. But yeah, I'd like I'd like to have time just to, this is a way of doing it. It's not the only way, but yeah, I'd like to just kind of flash you like what, what the tool that we use every day and we're training HVAC control contractors, how to set up AI applications quickly. Mm -hmm. and easily. Like I'm talking within 10 minutes. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Um, so as we start to wrap up, um we haven't heard much from mark or ken do you one of you want to offer your thoughts and also wrap up at the same time go ahead mr sinclair <laughs> you're muted ken you're muted That's a lot of name calling to me uh i just i really agree that that silo word does stick in one's throat. And uh, even from a farming point of view, a silo is just a place where stuff is stored. It's it's not a process. And it's part of the grain system. It's part of the silage system or, uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm in, in harmony with uh, nuking that word that, and it does have a negative uh, connotation. So once we're done discussing it, I think it'd be a good idea to uh, either change it or just not use it, not highlight it so much. So that would be my comment. Well, in the words of Brian Turner, I guess we're in violent agreement that we should get rid of that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. No, I think that's that's good. All right, so uh, let's wrap it up here then for, for this week. Uh, it's been a good conversation. We know what we're gonna be talking about next week, follow it up and uh, hope everybody has a good week. Um, and. See you all. Okay. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you all.